good evening to you all. Uh, what I like to share with you today is a, a development uh, model for uh, providing medical care to the masses. It's uh, this model that I'm talking about is particularly applicable to developing countries like ours and also the very populous countries. What are the issues uh, with affordable medical care? Most of these are well known, of course, but uh, let's just go over a few of them. Uh, we are all very familiar with the kind of crowds that exist in our hospitals. Very poor doctor to patient ratio. A doctor has to attend to a huge number of patients in a very, very limited time. Not only that, the people have a very low paying capacity. They don't have the money to pay for, let alone uh, getting uh, treatment, but even getting diagnosed or monitored. The medical equipment is still, most of it is imported. And it is not necessarily uh, built according to the kind of needs we have. What are the kind of needs we have? We need equipment which is high throughput because there are just too many patients. We also need equipment which is low cost. Now, if you open up any of these so-called imported instruments, more often than not, you will find that the technology being used in those equipment is maybe a decade old, if not more. So today, if you were to redesign and re-innovate, not only can you improve its efficiency, because modern electronics and IT gives you the facility to do that, but you can build it at very low cost. So you have a double gain. You can build it at low cost, and it, it's going to be more efficient. The Western companies, of course, will not do it because they have a successful product in the market. And the kind of market they are addressing is not particularly the one that we are looking uh, for solutions for, the, uh, for that kind of uh, market. So, uh, well, how did I start in this, thinking about this? Uh, started about 10 years ago, and uh, I have had the opportunity to work in fundamental physics, doing all experiments, theory, computations, and so on. So, uh, but all this blue sky research or fundamental research is supported by society after all. And one could say the knowledge generation itself ultimately pays back. But the question was, can one do something in the short run, where the gains or the payback to the society is more direct and tangible. So the question was, can we? So the only way I thought to do that was to prove it to oneself first. So what I did was just started working with industry, picked up some of the problems, so this is now an industrial environment. It is not entirely clear or you are not sure whether coming from a background like that doing fundamental physics and that kind of work, whether one can contribute to something where you have usable products in the market. So uh, for example, I developed a an automatic compression testing machine which is used in civil engineering kind of uh, environments. Also uh, did some solutions for the Delhi Metro while it's being built. And uh, so these are worked right from the concept stage to the market stage. And once that was successful, uh, the uh, message was, yes, we can. So. So this was uh, then took about five years to do. 
then the next step was, now we have to take up challenges, what to do. So uh, there was this thing at the background that uh, medical care for the masses. And one had to find ways now where, remember that we have the requirements, it has to be low cost also, so that it has to be affordable. And there I started thinking about uh, uh, our students in colleges, uh, particularly in science and engineering. The kind of work, uh, laboratory work or project work that the students do is extremely repetitive. And uh, there's hardly any field developed for how whatever they learn, whatever you learn in the classroom actually applies. Hardly any field for that. Uh, Richard Feynman, I remember, uh, tried this on, on some students. He took a situation in, in nature, pointed out to his student and said, do you know how this works? And of course, the students were blank. Then he said, can you tell me what this phenomenon is? Can you define this, a physics phenomenon? And out came the reply, you know, verbatim, reeling off words, uh, very fluent. After that, he said, now can you tie up the two? This concept and what you are observing here. Again, total blank. So, the difficulty is that once you try to apply whatever you learn in classroom to a real life problem, there may be concepts from chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 9, chapter 11 together that give you the solution. But what you learn in classroom is problems after chapter 1, problems after chapter 2, just back of the book problems. Doesn't tell you how uh, this applies in real life. And yet, the mantra that I would like to give to the students is that, see, rocket science has its own place in the country. It does the nation proud and so on. But there is still, there are a lot of problems around us which are amenable to solution by just whatever you have learnt in class. No more than that. Okay. So, that the yes we can turns into a capital V here because now there are students involved. And together, uh, that makes uh, a very suitable developmental model for a country like ours. In the sense that, uh, voice, what I started doing then was that I took up a few problems. Let's say I want to develop a medical instrument. Divide that up into well-identified modules, tasks, articulated and then I distribute it. Or I hold a, usually a workshop every year where I describe this to a lot of students. And then students opt for these projects and we integrate them. Now as this exercise proceeds, very soon the senior students who have learned some, some of this art start uh, contributing in another sense that they are able to now uh, pull in the younger students and the junior students and help them out with the uh, uh, developmental exercise. So, it, the, the whole development becomes very, very distributed and uh, this then makes the whole exercise extremely cost effective because in the West, the major costs involved in any of these development is not material. It is basically manpower and I have umpteen number of examples where most of the cost is for intellectual property. We pay through our nose for that intellectual property. And yet, we have all the creativity and innovation within our community, which can be used. So, uh, the costs for development can be really offset by involving this huge manpower base that we have, which is lying totally unutilized so far. Then of course, we, we add our innovations and we use modern concepts of uh, like virtual instrumentation. 
so that you don't build hardware, you put whatever functions that are possible by hardware into software or firmware and try to use that. And also uh, use more often than not off the shelf components rather than very proprietary kind of things which a, a lot of uh, western equipment would use because of economic reasons. But here the goals are different. So, and uh, the results were that you have already seen a pulse oximeter built, but uh, uh, believe me that once you get something on the working on the bench to convert it to a product which is sellable in the market, that's 80 or 90 percent of the time goes after that. So, we, we've, uh, there are two examples of what we have built with participation from students like you. In Delhi. Uh, here is an oximeter with a uh, bill of materials cost of 1500. The ECG machine I am going to show you today, uh, a demonstration which was built for around 2000 rupees. This is all now patents have been filed. We are trying to uh, commercialize uh, this kind of equipment. And let me also emphasize low cost does not mean low quality. And let me just show you. This is a typical ECG trace that we get out of this. And as one of the industry people who came to talk to us about commercialization said, how do you get this textbook quality? Because of innovation. Whatever you learn in class is all that is here, no more. So, so we converted yes we can to yes we have. And as I said, it is with the participation of just students like you. The next thing is, how do we scale it up? Now, because there is uh, still too many things to be done, too many uh, such things required. So that brings us to the question, how we will now? What to do next? And here, students are involved, scientists and engineers are involved, colleges are involved, R&D institutions are involved. So, for the students, I have already said, you have to believe that, yes, you also can, number one. For the scientists and engineers, it means that there has to be this extra effort involved in picking up problems and breaking them out, up into work elements which are amenable to solu solutions by students. Okay. Involve them and train them in, in that particular fashion. Also, more often than not, what scientists would do is once the idea works on the bench level, they would find it intellectually more challenging to move on to the next problem. It is somebody else's job to convert this into a product. The West has really mastered it. Converting science into technology, that is interface, that interface is excellent. We still have to do a lot in that area in our country. So in the, in the, at least in the short run, it is the scientists and the engineers who will have to walk the extra mile, convert whatever science they do development they do into products. Uh, of course, if we are going to involve students, then colleges have a big role to play. That, uh, first of all, they have to uh, in, uh, interact with all these research and development institutions, which are more often than not uh, government uh, uh, sponsored in our country. And this mode of learning not only it should be there in R&D institutions, but colleges can also adopt these kind of methods in their curricula. In the lab, rather than have a fixed set of experiments which are done in, in a semester or what, these can always be project based and these can be dynamic as, as, uh, as things evolve. And the R&D institutions, of course, have to 
recognize this potential and open themselves up to uh, the students and using uh, and giving them this kind of training where and it is uh, the R&D institutions where most of the facilities exist. But most important of all is that all these teams have to work in tandem, have to work in sync. And that's only when we'll be able to convert how we will to yes we will. So this uh, device is, is a right now a PC plugin device which as you can see, measures uh, the ECG, the chest lead is measured one at a time, so it has to be moved, but there can be many versions of it where all leads can be measured at the same time. This was developed, there are several modules in it, which were developed by students from uh, here at NSIT, the MIT School of Engineering Technology, and also from uh, uh, DCE and a few other institutions. So again, the methodology that we followed, little modules, whatever goes into it, are developed by several students, and then we then integrate all those. Most of the hardware in this has been replaced by software. There is a microcontroller and contains all that. That is why the cost is so low. And as I said, this weighs only 200 grams. It connects the uh, leads to the uh, arms and the legs and one chest lead and it connects via a USB port to the computer. Here is the application. It has facilities to register a patient, so uh, all details can be put in. And then a single button just starts the acquisition. It's a self-calibrating device. Calibration is also built in. has facilities to store uh, all the records in a database so that they can be recalled later on. And imagine in a hospital environment, all this data is available online. The doctor saves a few minutes. By the time the patient reaches the doctor, all the data is on his screen. Even if you save two minutes for the doctor, it's a huge increase in efficiency. And by having such equipment, let's say now you combine all these instruments into something like an ICU monitor. Think about a, a situation where you can have an ICU monitor for less than 10,000 rupees. Now the most of the cost in establishing an ICU in a hospital then is will not be instrumentation, which today that is the, a prohibitive cost. So uh, all of you have contributed to this. 